Welcome everybody. This is No Bullshit Gaming Podcast, two and a half gamer session number 49. We're sharing actionable insights, dropping knowledge for our day-to-day -day UA, game design and ad monetization drops. Definitely not discussing the latest industry news, but we are having so much fun. Let's not forget, this is still 4am conference discussion vibe, so let's not take it too seriously. Today, it's a special episode, so we are not talking about ad monetization, so Felix is not here. But we have uh, no Cameron. And, yeah, no decimals, no decimals <laughs> this time. <laughs> we have Clement and, and Cameron from Addictive and uh, the usual suspect, Jakub, and uh, myself, Matei. So before we dive into different uh, topics, but well, there is only one topic today, which is user churn prediction. So Clement, Cam, can you... Can you give us a little bit of uh, intro from from your side, uh, Clam? Uh, let's start with you. Sure. Thanks for for having me. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm Clem uh, Clem Favier. Uh, work for Addictive, a uh, company that just celebrated its uh, ten year anniversary a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, what we do, we focus on uh, app retargeting as well as cross promotion for apps and games. Yeah, and my name is Cam. I've been with the company for about five years working with uh, Clement, uh, first on retargeting, but then on our newer products around uh, cross-promotion. But how you guys get got into the into the games and then addictive afterwards? That's in, that's interesting part also. So let's let's uh, bring that in as well for, for the audience. I'm interested as well. So we know addictive. So now how about yourself, Clem? So how did you get in, in, into games? Um, well, by joining Additive, which was uh, more than seven years ago now, mm. um, definitely wanted to work in uh, in startups, and uh, was uh, yeah the, the first one I had the chance to to join, and uh, it's been a, a great ride since then. Joined as a more on the data side, so that's why yeah. I'm also interested in, in user churn in general, uh, and then uh, evolved to various role, and now I'm a COO. Nice. Cam, how about yourself? I was uh, doing sales in the U.S. healthcare system, which, depending on where you're from, um, you might know as like the most horrific thing ever. And so uh, <laughs> it was uh, quite depressing <laughs> to be into. Uh, and ultimately, I needed something that was a little bit uh, lighter in tone and also um, you know, living in San Francisco, the, the cost of living is quite high. So I looked around and was able to connect with the VP of sales at uh, Liftoff. So it was one of their first um, hires for sales. And, you know, there weren't a lot of mobile marketing sellers just walking around at the time. So I started with another guy who came from outside the industry as well. And it was probably the most difficult six month ramp mm. I've ever had. Just having, having to go to conferences and talk to people like yourself who had been in the industry a while and start to d disperse some of the uh, companies that say they do everything and really understand what they ultimately do and, and start to kind of get the lay of the land with the industry, but was really taken. I think my first conference was uh, GDC in San Francisco. I bought my own ticket and went just to uh, network and talk to people, but really just uh, how, how wonderful and uh, sharing a lot of folks in the industry are with knowledge and expertise. And so have been kind of hooked ever since and uh, nice. had my first child. And so couldn't do the commute anymore. And uh, ultimately <laughs> was looking for a company as good as Liftoff and their DNA and kind of core values and what they were doing. And Liftoff was more focused on UA at the time and Addictive presented a new challenge with retargeting. And so I was really attracted to what they were doing and came on board about five years ago. Nice. Also, we are back from PGC. <clears throat> Kim, you're already home or you're still in Europe? I'm home. I, I nice. was a quick trip. I got in <laughs> over the weekend, just experienced London in a few days and then flew back on uh, on Wednesday. So I, it still doesn't seem real, but um, the San Francisco <laughs> weather is very akin to London. <laughs> so I think it's all, it's yeah, all good. So we're back. Yeah. Any 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 quick comments from from your end before I start uh, um, kind of ranting about the, the PGC? Uh, it was it was a good conference though. It was a good yeah. conference. I mean, I, I I'm sure you had a ton of insights from the content and everything. Um, my overall impression were just like people are very hungry to reconnect. I haven't been to too many in person conferences, and 
I think there were over 2000 people there, which was pretty crazy. And then, uh, you know, seeing the dance floor on Monday night, particularly with so many countries and dancing styles represented was uh, amazing to see. I was just in awe. And then uh, I think from the conference level, just like M&A and Web3 are, are very much in full gear, despite the economy. I mean, a lot of uh, people are finding out about job losses and things. So a lot of networking around that, which was great to see people reconnecting and finding new opportunities. But um, definitely Web3 was still a huge part of what people were talking about um, as far as what I saw. Yeah, it was good to <clears throat> good to meet people face to face. It was really, really like overcrowded. There's almost uh, nowhere to, to move uh, uh, in the venue. Yeah. The, the talks... Um, I guess it was okay, but the, the level of um, you no know, developers versus service providers, or the well the percentage or the ratio is uh, definitely way more skewed towards the the sales provider service providers. Uh, I, I I saw I saw one panel where there was like one developer surrounded by five service <laughs> service <laughs> providers, and it felt really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> So they're definitely hunting you down. Um, so I guess like that would be my my feedback to, to PGC when I, I talk to them to actually try to tr change this a little bit. But on the other hand, well, it was great. The, the dance floor on, the, on Monday night, especially after the, the official after party closed and we just went to a random bar where there was nobody, pretty empty. And then in 30 minutes, it was like packed, like 100 people. It was <laughs> incredible. Came. Just came, yeah. came there. That was great. <laughs> to speak about the service provider side of things too, it's like you see everybody having to deal with COVID and being totally overwhelmed. And then they're thrown to the wolves with like five service providers. I feel yeah. like half the mission for us is just to to let the, the folks know we're not serial killers and to be really respectful of <laughs> them getting hunted by everyone, you know? So yeah. I can I can definitely see it from both sides. No, it's, I, I I am in a very uh, nice position because well I'm the the UA consultant so I'm not being hunted that mu uh, hunted that much but I know like some of my former colleagues they said oh when <laughs> yeah like, you get the you see the glazed look in their eye and you're, you're like kind of flinching from you approaching so it's uh, it's good to be respectful of knowing what they have to deal with for sure and anything the the, the conference providers can do to help support that. Um, is good too. Like the meet to match system is a little bit tricky. The online system to create meetings, more of like a cultivated approach to mm. maybe help match up those folks for what they're looking for could be good in the future. Yeah, it's like a meet and match system. I tried to open it once or twice and they're like, no, <laughs> it's not, <Yeah. laughs> not happening. It's not happening. Okay. Well, you, Jakub, you weren't there, not there, uh, Clem. I, I didn't see you as well in the Addictive Crew. So I guess uh, next time. No, no, I I hope so. Yeah, next time. Yeah. yeah, kids do to this time. Clem was steering the ship while all of us were dancing. Oh yeah, late into oh, the yeah, evening. Yeah. <laughs> I was answering him on Slack to make sure he knew I was still alive, but that was about nice. it. Nice. All right. <laughs> Anything interesting, Jakub, uh, happened in the last uh, week for for you? Mm, Not so much. Regarding mm. the news or regarding the developments? Well, I guess like your life. My life, like uh, everything's <laughs> hype up everything. about the new Harry Potter game. I'm really looking forward next month. So <sighs> that's 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 still on the shopping block. I know oh you hate God. open worlds, but oh it's going to be pretty big. It's the most wishlisted game on Steam currently. And really? it's going to be very, very big. Okay. Very, very big. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Let's let's talk about the, the user churn then. Uh, I think everybody knows... Uh, what's uh, user churn but as a reminder um so i think like there's like two two um, perspectives one from the from the game dev side and then one from let's say the marketing point of view so Jakub, can you can you tell like um the audience like what is your defi definition of, of user churn and like uh, how you kind of take a look at uh, like look at that mm. Usually when we were looking into it, it also boils down uh, how you define it because I know that we were talking about before and I know that, let's say, on the Match 3 project I worked before, we would 
count something as churn where the users didn't log in for two days. Some people are more lenient and they stretch it to something like five days, even maybe a week, depends on the level of engagement. Some games has just different rhythms than the others. It's it's normal. But what ultimately you want to get is some kind of a formula prediction or let's say a system that will pretty much tell you that, okay, this is a player that's entering this kind of a risk group. What can we do with him before he actually leaves? Because that's what the prediction is all about, of course. And the other problem is there that, uh, like, for instance, one of the best predictors for churn for me uh, during the years were uh, lower and lower session counts rather than not being online because not being online can mean that let's say you were on a holiday or there was some kind of event in your life that happened and you didn't have time for a game but you log in so a there's conference. like conference yeah a conference yeah. so like three sessions three sessions three sessions zero sessions zero session and then suddenly again three sessions that and but you already counted this churn if you you know your your model is kind of not accustomed to that but rather than for instance the typical churn for me would be something like three sessions, three sessions, two sessions, two sessions, one sessions, zero sessions, where you can clearly see the lowering engagement going forward where that was your time, that you were supposed to do something between that time. So that would be some kind of, let's say, basic definition how user churn I was like encounter, encountering this throughout the years. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, also, but how about the like the different perspective? Actually, the marketing perspective. So, the guys, how are you looking at at, at user churn and uh, and then not only the the user churn, but then actually like the prediction that Yaku mentioned? Because uh, honestly, when I was doing all the UA stuff, then uh, well, it wasn't really a part of the the daily daily UA job. Yeah, for sure. I mean, on on our side, it's pretty much, of course. Uh, a data science job to, to be uh, predicting that. And we consider user churn basically as the probability of a user to not come back to the app. Um, and that's basically what we're trying to assess with the highest accuracy possible uh, with our data science team. So that's that's really the that's really the goal. Okay. Uh, and uh, with the data science team, so are you are you building uh, what well, well, Obviously, the, with the predictions. So, so how does that work? So, do you have uh, machine learning models, or, or what kind of uh, like how, how does it work? How does it work? AI. Please tell me AI. AI. Yeah, yeah, AI. <laughs> Obviously, AI. Uh, yeah, using AI, chat GPT. <laughs> what, what else? Yeah, yeah. We just write a prompt, and then it all uh, comes out very nicely. Uh, no, no, but I, I think yeah, the, the data science process is is very uh, very interesting. Um, basically, always starts as any project with the, the business need. Um, so why are, are you doing what you're doing? So in this case, it's in the end, ultimately, it's about increasing uh, LTV of users and uh, retention of users within either your app or your studio, basically. How do you want to do that? Well, by identifying users who are at risk of living, basically, to, uh, you know, to perform some marketing actions to uh, keep them within your ecosystem. And what, you, what do you do to do so? Well, you build a predictive model that's trying to predict if users are going to leave. That's sort of what it is about. The second step is uh, you define the data science goal. So basically, it's the metric you are looking to optimize. So it's really a, a data science metric. Could be uh, accuracy. The one we, we use a bit technical. It's called the AUC rock. It's called the area under the curve. Um, mm. And it's very important because a machine learning model can be very good at one objective, but very bad at another one. So you really need to say, okay, what is the metric you are going to optimize? So I said in our case, it's a area under the, the curve. It's basically a metric that uh, actually checks if we're ranking the users in the right order. So basically, if we compare two users, one who churned, one who didn't, we want that we predicted a higher churn score for the one who actually churned. Basically, that we're ranking users in the right order. That's really what we're aiming to do. The next thing, and it's super important because that's what's gonna allow you to compare all the different models that you're gonna build. Okay. Uh, the third step is you need to define a baseline. So what sort of a, a basic model that you could do and what is the, the, the accuracy of this, of this model? So if you were, for instance, to do something random, like flip a coin, it would be 50% accuracy. 
Um, that's super important because when you do your first models, you want to compare them to this base baseline. And just to give you an example, for instance, for user churn, if you were to do a simple model that would look at, you know, the past activity for the last seven days and say, okay, you were active in the last seven days, you're not going to churn, you were not active in the last seven days, you are going to churn. This model on average would be 75% accurate or even 80% accurate in some cases. So if your data science team comes with a model, say, oh, awesome, we did a model 70% accurate. Well, in the end, it's total crap, just because, you know, basic rule of thumb <laughs> would, have given you, would have given you an 80% accuracy. So that's very important to have a baseline. Yeah. That's basically what would the marketer uh, think in terms of, yeah, a basic rule of thumb to do so. Um, based on that, you build your model. So usually they read, you know, a scientific literature, try a couple of uh, different uh, machine learning approach. I, uh, yeah. the word. And, uh, <laughs> and finally, you compare uh, uh, that to your goal. So in this case, we compare the, the AUC, the, the accuracy, let's say. And finally, once you have uh, something that is satisfying, you implement it in production and you monitor with a couple of KPIs just to check, you know, if it's running um, well on a daily basis and if uh, the accuracy is stable over time. Okay. So do I, do I get it right that if I build something at home with my random data scientist and we get out with 70% accuracy, we are considered baseline crap, yeah? <laughs> For a charm model. Don't make me say model. I, okay. I, did okay. <laughs> I don't want to have any problem with it. All that I say in Steam, the gaming industry, please. No, no, no I'm, of course. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. This is no bullshit gaming podcast. So yeah, yeah, like, of, course, of course. Nothing else. For yeah, us yeah, positive numbers. thinkers out there, it's better than better than random. So it's glass half mm. full of thinking. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay, but then. Uh, Two questions. So what's the like the minimum amount of data to have at least like some statistical significance? And then if 70% it's crap, then what's to, it should, it, the best case scenario is obviously 100%, I guess, right? So, but anything yeah, yeah, in indeed. between. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, statistical si significance, uh, this is basic, uh, a number of users. So I would say um, even started at 100k uh, MAU, even a little lower, could already give you some uh, interesting results. What you're checking basically here is, is your accuracy good enough with the volume you have? And um, is it sort of stable over time? That's sort of the, the two things you're going to look at to know if you have enough data to do so. And uh, in terms of a good accuracy, what we uh, seem to be reaching on a regular basis would be around 95 uh, AUC rock, so ninety five percent accuracy. Ninety five. Yeah. Okay. How how reliable yeah. would you say then are these models regarding different sources of traffic? Because if you train it of one source of traffic and then suddenly you know whatever new creative comes in or whatever Matya starts ah. to do crap with his job as usual. Look at this new uh, guy on, uh, on the so horizon. There's, <laughs> there's pretty much new new kind of traffic going into it. Is it gonna you know destroy the model or how how reliable it can fit with it? Yeah, yeah. I would say the model is doing uh, predictions as if you were to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And then every action, every marketing action you, you do is basically to sort of uh, counter that. So the output is the model. If, yeah, if you do nothing, this is sort of what would happen. Um, and then any marketing action are going are gonna to help you. So it's going to improve, if I understood. Exactly. It's going to mm -hmm. improve. And, exactly. And just so, so people understand really the, this uh, AUC uh, measure, it's basically... Mm -hmm. We check if we rank uh, users in the right order. So basically, we're going to compare uh, two users, one who churned, one who didn't. And our goal is that the user who actually churned had a higher churn score than the one that didn't. And we do that for all the combinations that are possible. And in 95% of the cases, we're correct. So there's only 5% of the cases where we said, OK, this user churned and this one didn't. And the scores was actually uh, in the opposite direction. Mm. That so, sounds like the usual kind of a scientific uh, significant statistic, like the what's the uh, you know the the p p value. Yeah, sorry. Um, what? Okay, uh, but then you you mentioned uh, obviously KPIs. So so what 
what are usually the the things that are companies looking for i i would guess retention but uh well uh, retention is nice but then i eventually well aiming for getting roas after the, like out of different things so which way retention monetization how how to think about it how can this kind of like improve these uh, these kpis yes i guess the Another way to do uh, to, to phrase the question would be, yeah, you, you've got this nice uh, churn prediction model. It seems to be accurate. And uh, what what do you do with it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. That would yeah. be <laughs> exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and why yeah, is that, it important? That's definitely the good important. question, right? Exactly. <laughs> because, yeah, we have this nice model. We had fun uh, building it. But uh, what do we do uh, with that? Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a lot you, you, can, uh, you can do. Um, you can leverage it for, I think, three sort of categories for product uh, in the product perspective, uh, for owned media, such as, you know, uh, SMS, emailing, push notification, and for paid media, such as um, retargeting and, and cross promotion. And uh, we can we can deep dive into, into those three if, if you'd like. Yeah, of course, because I, I'm pretty interested to, to know like, how do we keep the, the the players active actually and you, yeah you mentioned push notifications i would say well there are other things like email marketing retargeting so like uh which way to go uh because obviously yeah we have model but then <laughs> that's only the part of the of the job yeah and you have to take into account the ltv of the user right and kind of the genre of the game that you're looking at so for hyper casual Retargeting doesn't totally make sense all the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> the user LTV is quite low, and that churn is naturally going to happen super, super quickly. So you can look at cross-promotion as a solution for that because you're just keeping that user within the, the ecosystem. But then for more of a, a, a mid to hardcore game that you get you know, typically a large percentage of the revenue coming from a small amount of purchasers. It's looking at the LTV of the users within the churn model and kind of predicting how to avoid cannibalization, um, you know, before moving that user to another game or keeping them in that existing game through a number of mechanisms like um, in-game events or, you know, uh, other uh, incentives to, to keep them coming back over time. Hmm. Okay. Would you consider would you consider being like the model being used more in a way that it tries to kind of increase the LTV before the user churn, and it will eventually churn, or rather tries to prolong the retention in a way that it significantly increases the player kind of lifetime spent time within the app or a game? Sorry, this time. I mean, like those are kind of very big trade-offs, if I understand correctly. That mm -hmm. one thing is we're trying to squeeze more money as much as we pos as possible in a way that mm -hmm. probably at some point the model will tell us like this user will churn anyway. So that mm -hmm. that's one way. So let's throw him a discount that's like completely no brain, five hundred percent discount. Let's cut the spending gap in half. Whatever this is, the last resort we can throw at you, or rather, whatever. Let's make the game much more easier rather for him to kind of keep him within the app probably like that pesky level in candy crush that have you know blocked you for three months finally <laughs> it's very easy to do yeah i think it can be used in both scenarios right uh concurrently so you have the product team really focused on eliminating those roadblocks and then the marketing team going after those incentives to to maximize ltv and then ultimately having to do that trade-off between cutting their losses with uh, retargeting and looking at cross promotion, particularly with what seems like a more steady release schedule of games coming out this next year. It seems like a lot of studios are focused on being more aggressive and uh, I think more timely in their release schedule. And so uh, predictably moving those users along if they're stagnant or, or much likely to turn um, from the statistical perspective. Any interesting, uh, interesting numbers? That, oh, sorry, Jacob. No, like just want to hang a little bit more within this cross promotion mm. team because I think it's kind of important here. Uh, like in my days, or let's say in in my eyes, if I look at the market, I think there's like very, very few companies or even genres that can do this. Would you say it is kind of limited per genre? Because if you let's say whatever AFK Arena, 
you don't have another AFK arena sitting somewhere in your portfolio that you can move yeah. the users to. But if yeah. you're king, you have 15 other match three games or play rigs. Yeah. So I guess that's much better. But rather than the question would be, would you still consider it be effective within current days of like the new market paradigm of IDFA and everything being cut down, like, like pretty much being it the focus currently that people kind of try... New paradigm. To- Oh my God, where, where the fuck I am? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Keep the if you, if you start talking about portfolio. tectonic shifts and I'm, I'm just, you know, hanging out immediately. Content fortresses. <laughs> I am, of course. Yeah, I mean, so so one thing that we do specifically is use IDFV um, in lieu of IDFA to have a way to, to, to connect with those users. But you're exactly right. I mean, if you have a couple mid to hardcore games, there's not a huge use case for it unless you start to launch that release schedule. And I think with the paradigm shift of how Hi. how how games are <laughs> some good mirroring for you. Uh, yeah. how games are changing their monetization strategy, there's a lot of um, I think changes in how that model is gonna look hyper casual with uh, you know what's happening to ads and other other genres having to be more aggressive to have more games out there there becomes a larger use case for it. How quickly that gets adopted is is TBD. Eric Seifert and his predictions has, you know, recommended everybody do cross promotion, but it kind of feels honestly in conversations like the early days of retargeting where maybe some had tried it. I know Matei has had some successes with it in the past, but um, you know, it's specific to the company and mm. and a lot of these companies are set up to run UA specific to each title. And so those teams coming up warming up to the idea of sharing their best users is not totally a a happy one so it relies a lot on the politics of individual companies and their adoption rate of new technologies and their willing to willingness to test i think that's always kind of the litmus test for how how these things can be adopted and and also how they get measured you know i think some of the attribution companies have done a good job of starting to set this up for the future where it's very similar to ua in terms of how it's attributed but cost um just without the cost because it's not you know you're not buying a user from the open market you're kind of moving them along but generating installs so looking at kind of LTV over time as they go throughout the portfolio and looking at portfolio lift over time. But there are still like the and discussion. I think there's a oh, sorry. sorry, just one one comment. There's still discussion about uh, like like you said, if there is no uh, and like uh, another AFK arena in the portfolio, then well, you shouldn't do the cross promotion because it doesn't make sense. But I've I've seen it actually does make sense. It just needs like a proper segmentation, uh, and and you need to understand like what the target audience is and if if there is at least like a small overlap then it can actually create a, a lot of synergies yeah so the, I, I was thinking that uh, sorry i was thinking a scenario where you don't have another title um but in that scenario you're, you're talking about absolutely yeah, and if you have a couple of uh of apps within your your portfolio what you can do also is uh build some uh, affinity score, which, you know, would be, okay, what is the other title that is the most likely to uh, be of interest for my user? And then you're just going to basically recommend uh, that one specifically with your with your cross-promotion. I think I like even our favorite data platforms would have the statistics back in the days. I don't know if they are still available that you can see like a game and then there's some kind of a affinity score of that game. Like this user plays Clash of Clans. So he yeah, also yeah. plays yeah, yeah. this other game. Yeah. Usually they would provide you a overlap of uh, your title with other titles, which is sort of the level one of, of that. And then you can run uh, some, let's say, a bit more sophisticated model which would take into account a bit more data points um, to yeah, build a model that would recommend, okay, what's the, the most likely uh, app you're going you're gonna to be able to download at the user and that will interest you. Mm. Any other interesting uh, data points you can, uh, you can actually share about the, the user churn that uh, you know, we didn't, didn't touch still? Uh, Indeed, indeed. I think uh, gaming is uh, is actually quite interesting when it comes to uh, user churn in uh, in general because uh, 
I mean, those are apps you're supposed to be uh, using every day, uh, at least for, for most of the games. And uh, so basically, as soon as a user doesn't open the app for one or two days, uh, that's already a big, a big warning. While, for instance, for a shopping app or an e-commerce app, once you made a purchase, most likely you won't open the app for a couple of days, right? Unless you're a, mm. a very, very heavy purchaser. <laughs> yeah. um, but then at some point, your credit card might, might uh, you know, limit that. Um, so, uh, so that's actually uh, very interesting. And we do run a, a lot of uh, interesting analysis on um, the inactivity window of the user. So how long the user has been inactive and what's the likelihood of those users to come back. And uh, basically, if you wait already two days of inactivity, uh, those users have only 25% chance of coming back. If mm. you wait uh, seven days, then this probability is going to fall below 5%. So coming back to uh, Jakub's comment at the very beginning, I think that's why a lot of gaming companies would say, okay, a user did not open the app for seven days. I consider this user charm just because the, the likelihood that they're actually going to come back by themselves is super, is super low. So that's why uh, in gaming, it's very important to try to predict that and to act really early um and not wait too long because otherwise it's basically like if you wait too long it's a bit like doing ua all over again on your on your uh, users yeah. that, that actually charm basically how how early can you well let's say the model that you have been working on act upon like wh when's the fastest time in a way that it tells you like this user is looking like it's gonna churn like two days um, before he would actually churn, three days, or like what's the time between him actually churning and you are determining the you know risk group? I would have to check. I think we leave them a seven day window, you know, to come back and uh, and check if we if those users actually uh, actually churn, um, and we can start predicting basically right after the right after the install. Mm -hmm. Where it's actually a bit more difficult to predict is for users um, that have been here for a, a long time, you know, because you don't have the, the starting point, you don't have their their first uh, um, yeah their first touch point with the app. For those users, usually it's a bit it's a bit harder uh, to to model. Mm. Also, because you mentioned one hundred thousand uh, DAUs, but yeah, go go ahead. Yeah. No, like for me, like this would be very very kind of let's say rewarding in a way that if you can actually like bring back those whales or like prevent the whales or the very heavy spenders or power users for going out because those i guess are the most kind of i, I always so uh, like i have uh, like this one other game we were working on and i know like we were making content for it like crazy and just six percent of the player base was at the end of the content it was eating it like crazy and that that was the power users because they were responsible for like like i don't know 50 60 percent of overall spend yeah. or something and Even and more. those are exactly the ones that, that they are there for years and it really pays off if you can prevent their churn <laughs> so that would be something that i think is kind of important like if you say you start ranking the user if i understand from the beginning so yeah. would it would, would it seem something like like 100 100 100 for like one to two years and then suddenly the score would go, go down that's how I would kind of imagine it. Ah, you mean in terms of the di distributions of the of the score? Yeah, you would have honestly quite a big chunk of users with very very high scores, so very mm -hmm. very high probability of of churning. I mean, I guess it's not a, a surprise, right? We 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 know the the stats of the 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 few users that actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, keep playing the apps after let's say uh, 30 days uh, post installed definitely uh, definitely super low so obviously uh, no no difference in the in the jump prediction you have a, a yeah, big bunch of users with very high likelihood uh, to to churn for sure and then it sorts of um, smooth out yeah, yeah. decrease yeah smooth mm -hmm. out exactly and I think the okay. when you talk about waiting seven days, the probability goes down to five percent. That kind of speaks to the the rule based or ba the baseline model. And you know you can be losing your really valuable whales unless you have that more specific model to your business and have invested in there where it's close to the ninety percent range. So you're more ac accurate in your projections going after those those users given so much revenue usually is coming 
coming from the, those whales. And so really being as accurate as possible and leveraging that versus kind of the, the rule of the mob and that, you know, it's going to go down to 5% after seven days on average, but you're not, not speaking to the specific behavior patterns of the whales who are highly engaged over time. So, you know, it's, it's worth kind of uh, dividing between those two things. Okay, now I'm getting back to the 100k DAUs that I, I wanted to ask. <laughs> Didn't let me, but like it's like not every game actually out there is able to get 100k DAUs. So mm -hmm. if I have a small game, then what it means like I'm pretty much fucked, and then then I can just say goodbye to all of my uh, well churned users, and I can't yeah I can't use the the prediction. No, I don't think so at you all. I think it's speaks, yeah. yeah, go ahead. It speaks to the, the different tools that you have at your disposal to reach users. So in-game messaging, things like that, you know, uh, are very easy to reach those users and and get them on their on their journey. Um, for cross promotion, reaching, you know, your active users per day to drive meaningful scale and rationalizing the investment in a product around that or an investment in that. Um, it can require that 100k DAU threshold just yeah. to see the minimum amount of installs necessary to rationalize that investment. But there are a number of ways that you can also reach those users outside of that um, at times. In terms of those who have opted out, that can be a challenge because reaching those users is, is getting more and more difficult. So I think that's where the investment becomes rationalized and being able to reach even those users who have opted out. Clem, your your comments. Yeah, um, I would say otherwise you're you're back also to with the with the baseline model, which is okay. not the best. <laughs> okay, okay. Of, uh, so it's not completely educated. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, no, no, but you, you can still try out because uh, speaking to our data science team, it's, it's it, they actually said you could try actually below. Um, but I think it's about trying and checking again this accuracy to see if, if that makes sense for, for you, basically. Yeah, because uh, in that case, like what kind of uplift can, let's say on the retention side, can I can I actually get uh, in terms of the, the prediction uh, for, for the user churn? Because it would be definitely like uh, rationalizing that. Uh, that I mean, if you have those 100k users and you start to Even low, it. even low. low, low even lower, like, okay. Even lower, of course, because for those like smaller companies, uh, you know, they're very much, you know, about uh, the margins. And, yeah, 100k uh, users, the EU is very, very high, even if we are talking something like mid-core, because mid-core games yeah. are kind of very, very uh, user spend heavy, but regarding users themselves, it's kind of low. That's why you have those crazy RPUs, because that's how it works. And that's that's connected to to my comment because uh, they need to know if if this is actually worth it. So if you know you say there's a very nice uplift uh, that they can actually expect, uh, then obviously that's point for the for using these type of things. So any 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 data yeah. points you, you can you can share or anything? Yeah, indeed. Um, so. Again, what's tricky here is that the, the, the uplift, the sorry, the, the chunk prediction model per se doesn't do anything. It's really about what what you're making out of it. So um, yeah, okay. it all depends again garbage on your in, out. capabilities, <laughs> CRM and, uh, and and product team. Okay. But yeah, like there's some couple of uh, you know interesting uh, app retention be benchmark, for instance, that uh, apps try your doors or, or things like that, which mm -hmm. give you some sort of overall. Uh, numbers which are very interesting and um, basically they compare you know in terms of games um, companies who run uh, owned media remarketing versus those who don't and in this case you get a DSRT more than 200 percent uplift so it's really amazing and, and meaningful obviously and uh, for games who run paid media uh, remarketing so typically uh, app retargeting then uh, they have a, a 123 uh, DSRT retention uplift. So that's mm. sort of what you could get. And if you apply a, a churn uh, prediction model on, on that, you can, uh, I guess, easily double the, double the results. So that, that would be a, a ballpark estimate for, for what yeah. you can get. 
Okay, yeah, that's that's pretty nice. At least uh, horrible, yeah, a uh, really nice number. Yeah, from your point of view, if you have a when you had the 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 prediction short prediction model in place in terms of the you know the match three game that you worked before, uh, what kind of uh, activities you could done based on those number uh, numbers? Yeah, and... I would say it's it's again dependent on what we are aiming for and which genre we are in. Because for instance, a match three game, I would say this is like bread and butter of the whole game. Yeah, like this whole just trade off between retention and monetization and this kind of frustration tolerance at the end of the level, like how much losses a user can take before he converts or leaves, and you are pretty much A/B testing all the levels all the time. So. I would say this is some kind of a special scenario here because match three game is in the end a churn model within itself. That's mm. like how the whole thing is based and that's why it's so <laughs> difficult to build and everybody thinks like, oh, it's just dropping candies. We'll make a match three game. That's why there's yeah, thousands yeah. of them. But actually the machine <laughs> under it is the real magic behind it. So that's that's very specific. But if we take something like a mid-core RPG, for instance, uh, that I worked on before, I would say it's more of a the difficulty difficulty is definitely one thing and we know for instance we were having different matchmaking uh, offsets within the game so let's say a pvp uh, element was there and we were definitely skewing the some kind of a win rate that we wanted to get out of the user even though like it, it seems like it should be 50 50 percent but if no if if you are kind of winning losing too much you're definitely more prone to churn and winning is always the best like we talk about it on the podcast numerous times for instance marvel snap does it like you're playing bots uh in the, in the beginning of the game because developers wanted you to win because 50 50 percent win rate isn't even considered fair by humans to be honest like there were yeah. studies that people don't consider 50 50 percent fair they're considered something like 70 to 30 so it's just as you go and yeah i think all of these things can be utilized but again it's it's heavily dependent on how do you know your genre and your game and then when i have this information that like okay this user is let's say he's you churn score is going very very low so let's do something and that's the let's that's the product expertise that you need to do like let's offset his uh match match uh, matching elo so we can increase his win rate let's give him some kind of more resources out of nowhere so let's say suddenly we increase his um, daily economy resource game because that can be done for instance i've seen that in a random dice game uh, if you're losing, you're getting these kind of consolation prizes. So they're actually bombing you even with the rewards after you lose. And then there's lots of these, like I even seen that this kind of lower activity event that can be triggered where I actually didn't log into the game for like two days or one day. They automatically trigger this event that, oh, log in every day and you get this reward. And that at the end of the seven day, there's this big reward. And it's it's completely custom made to the user. There's no like global live ops running. So they have it just set up like that, that it's probably triggered by some kind of lower activity. And then it immediately gives the user some kind of a prevention mechanism. Right. OK, so that's from the from the game side. OK, any so I guess like uh, we can agree on like this is kind of important from both marketing and then the uh, the game design side. Any like final uh, advice for for companies who want to to kind of like leverage the user churn prediction, what they should do and what they should definitely not do, and uh, try to avoid the mistakes that you've seen that could happen potentially. Yeah, I mean, for one, it's to to look at if retargeting makes sense, leverage, you know, as much as you can of owned and operated channels, but, um, you know, work with a good partner to run a uh, pre-launch analysis and look at user behavior and see if retargeting makes any kind of sense for you monetarily. And then also start to structure your company in a way to allow for testing of cross-promotion and the proof is in the pudding, so see if it see if it actually works and start to to build around tests around that. Even, you know, at that DAU threshold we discussed, it could work just depending on your game. And so um, have an openness to testing mindset, I would say, or would be two of the keys uh, along with really understanding if retargeting works for your, your game or not. Nice. Perfect. 
All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, also, thank you very much for listening. Uh, definitely subscribe. I'll put some some information in the show notes uh, if you're going to uh, reach out to Clem or Cam. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you.